afternoon. So maybe now I would start. So we were talking about relative homology. So I briefly recall where we are. I mean, we basically we are just into more or less given the definition, and then now we have to do something about it. So relative homology. So X is a topological space. A is a subspace of X. So with induced topology, then as I had said, I can view, say, the n cycles, the n uh, chains on A to be a subset of the n chains of X. It's just the map from the n simplex to X whose image lies in A. I mean, the formal linear combinations of such maps. And uh, D. Uh, will map, obviously, Cn of A to itself. So it uh, respects the inclusion. So therefore, we can uh, form Cn of Xa, which is just a quotient and we have an induced map, so an induced differential which I still call D, from uh, this to the one with one less. So we still have D, um, which sends, uh, uh, which goes here to Cn minus one from Xa. Just uh, if we have any uh, <coughs> n chain in X, alpha, we look at its class modulo Cn of A, and this is sent to the class of D alpha modulo uh, the n minus one chains in A. Okay, so this was this definition, and then we define the corresponding homology in the usual way. So the, you know, here we again write first the cycles. Zn of Xa is equal to the kernel of D from Cn of Xa to Cn minus 1 of Xa. And uh, this, the cycles in Bn of Xa is equal to the image of the previous D. And as the D is just the kind of the quotient, the kind of the map induced on equivalence classes by the previous D, we have obviously that D squared is equal to zero. And so one is contained in the other. So Bn is contained in Zn. And so the homology, relative homology, is um, Hn of Xa, which is defined to be the quotient of the cycles by the boundaries. So it's the same thing that we did before. OK, so the reason why one considers these relative things is that they are tied together with the usual uh, homology of X and the usual homology of A by a long exact homology sequence, and so I want to uh, first talk a bit about exact sequences because I'm not sure if you, have, you know about them already. So this is some simple algebra, or whatever, homological algebra if you want. So, so I, so let, uh, so this is somehow maybe definition. So if I have A, F, B, G, C, so F from A to B and G from 
B to C, B, uh, say, is some kind of, it's a sequence of two of uh, homomorphisms of uh, abelian groups. So we say that this uh, sequence is exact at B, so is called exact at B if uh, the image of the first is precisely equal to the kernel of the second. If and only if the image of F is equal to the kernel of G. So if you look at it here, if you take these, if the map would be just, you know, for instance, just as a, so the relation to what we're looking at before, if you have this map, Cn of x goes to Cn minus one of x with d goes with, so maybe here's n plus one, n, n minus one with d. If we look at this thing, then this will be exact at Cn if and only if the nth homology is zero. By definition, because the uh, enthomology is the quotient of the kernel of this map by the image of this map. Okay, so in particular, so in particular, if uh, the sequence is exact, then uh, we have that the composition of the two maps is zero. But it's more, the kernel is precisely equal to the image. You know, that it would be, uh, that the composition is zero means that the image is contained in the kernel. Okay, so in more generality we can look at, uh, so if in more generally, if uh, say a, uh, say n plus one to a n to a n minus one to a n and so on is a sequence of uh, so possibly longer maybe infinite sequence of abelian groups of and homomorphisms We say the sequence is exact if it is exact at every element here. Okay, so at each step, the image of the First previous map is equal to the kernel of the next. Okay. So, in particular case that one looks at is a so-called short exact sequence. This is a sequence consisting of three things or of five, depending on how you count. So. A short exact sequence um, zero, so or, or an exact sequence zero goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero uh, is called short exact sequence. So what does it mean? So zero is also an abelian group. So we have that the kernel of this map of the F is equal to the image of this map. The image of this map is zero. So this is equivalent to the fact that F is injective. This is what this says. 
then here the image of uh, f is equal to the kernel of g and then here we have the again the zero uh, abelian group so the kernel of any map from c to the zero group is zero it is the whole of c so it means and and that and the kernel should be equal to the image of the previous map so we should have that g is in, is surjective so that's what it means that we have a short exact sequence like this these three properties <coughs> and just for later use I can make some remark I mean this is an exercise it's all somehow trivial but you uh, you know one has to so that one gets used to this concept so the first is this in some sense I just showed zero from a to say G to F to B is exact if and only if F is injective I just said it. second Uh, a goes to f to b goes to zero is exact if f is subjective. This I also just said. You know the image of f is the kernel of the zero map, so the whole of b. Um, and then by putting this together, if you have zero goes to a to anything b goes to zero is exact. So if and only if f is an isomorphism. Because after all, it's equivalent to being f both being injective and subjective. And then slightly more complicatedly, if I have uh, a alpha to b, better to see an exact sequence and um, and what say the second map injective and better injective so that means that the kernel of um, beta is, do I really want that? Yeah. No, I didn't. No, I think I wanted that. Hmm. Yeah, obviously, if beta is injective, then its kernel is zero, and then this is not the case. So, um, so if um, say gamma is injective, then uh, alpha is subjective. This is because if uh, gamma is injective, then its kernel is zero, which is equal to the image of beta. And so, which is equal to the uh, cook, and which is equal to the image of alpha. And so alpha is subjective. Okay, so these are all very simple things. And uh, the same way, uh, say if um, say A goes to alpha B beta C gamma B and um, say um, alpha is subjective 
then it follows that gamma is injective. So again, x is an exact sequence. So you can figure this out. This is very straightforward. So as an exercise, you can, if you want, prove it. So, <clears throat> so one uh, example of an exact sequence would be, for instance, you have 0 goes to z, and you take the say, the multiplication by 2 goes to z. Um, so the image are all the even numbers. And then the quotient will be z modulo twice z goes to 0. OK, <clears throat> that's that. Uh, and so this is an exact sequence. I should also maybe make another remark, which is also, which one can also see here. So if uh, 0 to a to b to c to so f g is exact, then c is isomorphic to b divided f of a. Which is, uh, I mean, also standard. I mean, the, the image, so c, the map is objective, so it's the image of g. And so the, uh, the, the image of the map is isomorphic to the source of the map divided by the kernel. That's uh, some homomorphism theorem. OK. So why do we deal with these exact sequences? <laughs> so now we want to come to some slightly more serious homological algebra, <coughs> make the whole thing a little bit more complicated by looking at exact sequences of chain complexes. So you know what chain complexes are. We have some, uh, so let A star D, B star D, uh, so a short exact sequence I want to deal, uh, C star D, the chain complexes. So that means we have, uh, you know, A n plus 1 goes with D to A n goes with d to a n minus 1, and so on. And same for b and c. Um, and now we assume we have a map f um, from a star d to b star d and g from, a, from b star d to c star d. the chain homomorphisms. So remember that this meant that uh, we have, you know, we have after all this map, we have a n plus 1, a n, a n minus 1, always the d. And this f is given by a map fn from fn plus 1. So a n plus 1 to b n plus 1. And here we also have the d. And this, so that we have a, an, a map of chain complexes, a homomorphism of chain complexes, or a chain homomorphism, means that we have all these maps at all levels, and they commute with D. So, so this diagram is commutative. And similar uh, for B and C. And now, so we have these 
two chain homomorphisms. And uh, we call uh, this an exact sequence, a short exact sequence of chain complexes, if at all levels we get a short exact sequence of abelian groups. So, so zero to A star to F, B star to G, C star is called a short exact sequence of chain complexes if for all n. So we have the corresponding maps, you know, at level n. So we have the map a n goes to f to b n, so f n, g n to c n. So if we complete this with zero here and zero here, if this thing is exact. So the fact that we have these two chain homomorphisms means that we have always this map f n and g n and the, uh, the statement that it's a short exact sequence of chain complexes means that this fn is always injective, the gn is always surjective, and the kernel of gn is always equal to the image of fn. Okay. And um, we introduce this because of the following theorem, which is... Um, this was, uh, yes? No, I mean, that's a misprint. Bn minus 1. Thanks. So, so we want to use, uh, we have introduced this concept because there is a certain theorem, which is maybe the most useful theorem of homological algebra, although it's not very deep, but it is a bit tricky, but anyway, it's very useful, and it's the following theorem. It's called the snake lemma. Um, and it says the following. So let um, zero goes to A star with F to B star with G to C star to zero be a short exact sequence of chain complexes. Then we have a long exact sequence for the homology of the chain complexes. You know, we, as these are chain complexes, I can form the homology. And uh, they, they, it is tied together by a long exact sequence. So then there is a long exact sequence So we have, uh, at some point, say we have Hn von of A star. So you remember that's the image of D, uh, the kernel of D from, H, from An to An minus 1 divided by the image of D from An plus 1 to An, as usual. So we have the map here, so, which is the map induced by F to Hn of um, P star goes to G star Hn of C star. And then we have uh, another map, which I call delta, which then goes to Hn minus 1 of A star F star Hn minus 1 of P star. 
and then with g star h n minus 1 of c star and so on. So, so here we are always delta. So you have an, an exact sequence like this for, for which goes to all the n. And uh, you can imagine why it's called snake lemma. It's just because of the form of this diagram. I mean, you write it down this way, and it looks like a snake. And as I said, f star and g star are the maps induced on homology by f and g. So this would mean that f star of the class in homology of, a, uh, of some element a will be the class of f star a, no, of, of f of a, f n of a, say, if a is in a n. Okay, so, and delta is called the boundary map. And so actually the most surprising thing about this, uh, this you know, so this f and g are somehow, f star and g star are the maps which are obviously induced by f and g. So they certainly exist, but the most surprising thing about this theorem is that this map delta actually exists, which goes from the nth homology of the last one to the n minus first homology of the first one. And, kind of, and then the whole thing is exact. So at every step, the kernel is equal to the image of the previous map. Okay, so this is um, a uh, statement in homological algebra, and it's proved by a method which is called diagram chasing. And uh, as some kind of so proved by diagram chasing. So, the, so somehow the idea is you take some element in some of these groups, or maybe some of the groups that we will see later, and then at each step, you can either take a pre-image under one of the maps that you have, or you can take the image under one of the maps. And you try to do this. You kind of let uh, you always do one of the two. And uh, somehow you try to, to chase this element through the diagram by either mapping it or taking the pre-image until it does precisely what you want. And, uh, <clears throat> This uh, sounds kind of difficult, and you will see now that the proof is maybe a bit confusing. But as a matter of fact, it's very simple, because at every single step, you have only very few choices what you can do. You can either take a pre-image under one of the maps or the image under one. So you have only very few possibilities of what you can try to do. You can basically try all of them. And if at all there is a proof, you will find it this way. So it's a kind of uh, something which one could easily program a computer to approve things. For the human being, it's actually slightly more complicated because it's uh, not so intuitive. So now let's try to prove this. <clears throat> so we will not prove the whole thing. We will prove, we will uh, construct delta, which is the most difficult thing. And uh, uh, in the notes, I've proven that it's, that it's exact here. But I actually will only prove that the composition of these two maps is zero, which is slightly easier. Just, uh, but you know, I, I do the most difficult steps, and then the other ones, you know, you have to just at each time you have to do something similar to check the exactness. But the most difficult thing is to actually construct the delta, and that we do as a first thing. So we want to so prove construct. Delta and uh, show uh, that say delta composed with G star is the zero map, which is part of the exactness here. So I write uh, as before. I write Z n of A 
equal to the kernel of d from a n to a n minus 1. And uh, I don't know what actually d is. No, I don't think I need this. And similar for b and c. So let's see what we can do. So I write, uh, so at some place, I have to somehow keep track of what I'm doing. So I write one diagram where you can see where we are. So we are here in A, B, and C. And so this is, you know, so and here we have, uh, say, we are at level N n minus 1 and n minus 2. So if we are here, for instance, we are in Cn, Cn minus 1, Cn minus 2, and so on. And so the horizontal maps are always given, you know, are given by Fn, Fn minus 1, so are given by F. Now this way, this is G. <laughs> and the vertical maps always given by D. No? So we have this. So now we start. So what do we want to do? We are supposed to make delta from h n of c to h n minus 1 of a. We have to construct such a map. So OK, we start. So let c be an element in h n minus n of c. And uh, so that means it's the class of an element c, I mean, of, a, of an n cycle c. So it is, c is an element of z n of c. No? It's an element. And then its homology class is there. So we have here, so this is our zero step. So here we have our c. So now we want to, I mean, we have to, from here, go all the way until here. So we have to somehow go backwards. So what can we do? We can apply this. We take an inverse image <coughs> under this map GN. So <coughs> anyway, so. So anyway, just to write it out, so we, we need to construct a delta of C equal to A for A and N minus 1 cycle in A. So the first step is, obviously, there exists an element B in Bn such that uh, C is equal to uh, Gn of B. This is because you know, we had at all level An to Bn to Cn is an exact sequence, so Gn is surjective. So we have here our element B, which maps to it. This is the first step. Now, we can uh, take its, uh, uh, we can apply the differential to it, d. And we get db. So we have db is an element in pn minus 1. And note, what happens if we map it here? We can apply here gn minus 1 to it, and we get to c. What do we get? We get uh, 
if we take uh, Gn minus 1 of db, you know, this commutes, uh, you know, these are chain maps, it commutes with it, this is d of Gn b, so which is the same, uh, Gn of b is c, dc, and c was a cycle. So this is zero. So this thing actually maps to zero here. So as we have an, so it means that db is in the kernel of this map gn minus one. So as we have an exact sequence, a n to b, a n minus one to b n minus one to uh, c n minus one, it is the image of some element here. So let me write, ah, now I don't have quite enough space. So, by the exactness, so this would be three, I think, there exists an element, a unique element say A in A n minus 1 uh, such that F n minus 1 from A of A is equal to dB. So we have here found our element A. And now the A is actually supposed to be this A here, so in order to see that it's good, we have to see that A is a cycle. So therefore, we should apply D to it, and it should become zero. Okay, let's see whether this is true. So, now note that this map Fn minus 2 is injective. Because, you know, the first map is always injective. We have a short note that Fn is injective, Gn is surjective. Huh? So, <clears throat> okay, so it's injective map. On the other hand, what is Fn minus 2 of dA? This is the same thing we just did. Uh, this is d of Fn minus 1 of A. <clears throat> yeah, but Fn minus 1 of A is dB. D, db. And I know that twice applying d gives zero. So I find that this thing maps to zero here, and as the map is injective, it's zero itself. No? I've said that Fn minus 1 is injective, so dA is zero. So thus, dA is equal to zero. So A is an n minus 1 cycle. And we define delta of C to be A. So <clears throat> should be slightly careful. I have not completely constructed because there were some choices. And I have to, one has to prove that the definition was independent of the choices. So this I call maybe an exercise. So A is independent of the choices. And there were actually two choices. So one choice was the choice of C, because 
C is a homology class, and we have chosen a representative. First, choice of C. No, just of the representative of C. And the second is that B, as B, we took some pre-image of our C. But, you know, the map, uh, nobody has said that the map GN is injective. So there will be more than one. So it's also independent, should also be independent of the choice of B. And that's actually both are very easy to check. You somehow have to show that if you take a different choice, then the, uh, what you get change, changes by a boundary. No? And it's quite easy to, uh, to do that. No, by so this will show, so modulo this exercise, I have, show, I have constructed this map. Okay? And I mean, you maybe really should try to, to see whether you can see this independence. It's really very simple. So now, now I want to prove the exact, this uh, statement. Um, so where is it? So we want to show the delta, no, composed with G, say, star, is the zero map. So we have, um, so this, you know, this map delta composed with G star will be a map from H n of B to H n minus one of eight. Okay. So, so let B uh, be an element in so B in H n of B star. So given by some cycle B in Z n of B. And um, we first take, you know, we first apply G star to it. So let's see. Uh, so C, G star of B. So which means that, so and I take C, the representative of it, to be G n of B. So now I want to show that the, uh, you know, if I apply now delta to this C, I will get zero. For this, in principle, I have to go through the whole of the definition of delta no? to see that I get zero. But there's one thing that one notices. So here, in the construction of delta, we had at some point chosen a B which maps to C. And here we do have, and I claimed it's independent of which one we chose, and here we do have a B which maps to C. So why don't we choose precisely that B here, okay. So, so in the construction of delta of C, so this is at step one, we have chosen A B in the N with um, uh, G N of B is equal to C, like here. So, so just choose now the B here as that. So maybe I should have given it a different name. But anyway, so. 
choose the B uh, yeah maybe I write it like this choose the B to be B bar so the B that the element that we have here which maps to C we chose the B here we are free to choose a an element of Bn which maps to C, and we chose the one that we are given here. What happens then? We, you know, B is a cycle. So we have then dB is equal to zero. Okay. So A is an inverse image of B by this injective map, an inverse image of DB by this injective map here. This map is injective. And now DB is 0. So A will be 0. Thus, OK, and this shows that this composition is equal to 0. Okay. So you see, it's, um, I mean, I do not expect that you can follow it quite as fast in all the details. But you see that, in some sense, <coughs> you know, we always do kind of the same thing. We uh, either take the image of something, we, or we show that the image under something by a map is zero, and then by exactness it comes from the one before. Or we want to show that something under D, something is a cycle, so we map it under, under D, we get zero. And in this way, we somehow move uh, forward and backwards until we precisely know who, what everybody does. And so in this case, we show that if we take delta of the C, which is uh, the same as delta of um, Gn T star of B, this is equal to 0. And so this was as much as I wanted to show. Obviously, you have to show many more things. You don't just have to show that this composition is 0, but that the image of uh, the G star is equal to the kernel of the delta. And you have to show the exactness at all the other places. But um, you know, this uh, gives you a fair impression of what you have to prove. All the other steps are somehow similar. OK, so this is this snake lemma, which is um, kind of a standard example of uh, kind of this uh, uh, argumentation by uh, diagram chasing. So now we, you have seen this once. And I actually, there is a book where, uh, I mean, this is a bit excessive, obviously. I think it's by search link, but I might be wrong. Anyway, so where he, it's about another topic. And uh, then he says a few things about diagram chasing and maybe proves some easy lemma and says, uh, afterwards, it says, exercise, use the methods used, take any book in homological algebra, take any theorem, and prove it. OK? Because the claim is that uh, you basically know uh, the tr for many things, this is all you need to be able to do. OK, so, but it's, you know, it's a bit excessive, obviously, but that is, um, OK, theorem. Now we get the long exact homology sequence. So we go back to our homology story. So. So we you know, are back to single homology. So let A in X be a subspace, X a topological space. And I, I actually want to explicitly write I, the inclusion 
from A to X. Then there is a, a long exact homology sequence. So, so you, you know, at some point you have this delta, each n of a goes to via the map induced by the inclusion h n of x goes to h n of x a by the map induced by the quotient map goes to h n minus with delta h n minus 1 of a and so on. So we have a long exact a homology sequence which goes to all the possible ends in this way. And this is, a, a, I mean, basically a corollary to this snake lemma. Because what do we have? Um, so by definition, If you look at the map, uh, you know, from C star of A to C star of X, which is given by I star, by the inclusion, and also the map from C star of X to C star of X A, which after all is just C star of X divided by C star of A, so at each level, though this means just at each level, we have I, I uh, n from C n of A to C n of X. And uh, we have the map from C n of X to C n of X A, which is equal by definition to C n of X divided by C n of A. So these maps are obviously chain maps are chain homomorphisms. I've said it before, you know, the, the inclusion of A with X commutes with differential, and the differential here, I mean, has been defined in such a way that we get a chain map. We just have said the class of something, D of the class of something, is the class of D of it. You know? so, by definition, it's a, these are chain homomorphisms. And also, obviously, for all n, if we look at the sequence 0 goes to Cn of A, goes to Cn of X, goes to Cn of X A, which is just defined as Cn of X divided by Cn of A, this sequence is exact. Because I've told you that CN of A can be viewed as a subset, as a sub, uh, set or a subgroup of CN of X, namely all those um, chains where, or for which all the simplices, instead of map making, mapping to the whole of X, just map to A. And, um, you know, <coughs> Here, you know, we have just defined this to be the quotient, so the, uh, certainly the sequence is exact. So at all levels, it's exact. So we have uh, 0 goes to C star of x, C star of a, obviously, C star of x to C star of x a to zero is an exact sequence of chain complexes.
now apply, now one just applies the snake lemma. And uh, the snake lemma says precisely that there is a long exact homology sequence in this form. That's precisely the statement that it made. Okay, so that's it. So we get this sequence. Now I should say um, you know, in the moment you know, one can question the usefulness of such a result because, you know, somehow, you know, maybe our aim will be to compute the homology of some spaces like X or like A. And now we have an exact sequence where we put in addition these relative homologies and we don't know what they are. So, uh, so we have kind of related the things that we want to know to other things that we do not know. Okay, so that by itself one could doubt whether this is a very useful thing to do. So this can only be useful and help us to, for instance, compute the homology of actual spaces if we have some way to simplify the computation of this, to somehow understand how one can compute these. And there is a theorem which uh, serve, serves this purpose, which is the so-called excision theorem which is the next thing that we are trying to do. But in this case, I mean, the excision theorem is really, uh, the proof is really complicated, and it's so complicated that I cannot possibly cover it in this course. It's not particularly difficult, but it's just very long. So it would take me maybe, uh, I expect, two lectures to to do it, and I mean, I don't have two lectures. Uh, but I will just state it and give some hints about why it's true, and then we uh, move on. So we have the excision theorem. So the statement is the following. So let X be a topological space. And let, um, say, Z and A be subspaces of X such that what do I want? The closure of Z is contained in the interior of A. So, so Z is the closure of Z in X, and A is the interior of A in X. So this is the um, <coughs> smallest closed subset, which contains Z. So the intersection of all closed subsets of X, which contains Z. Is, and uh, this is the uh, union of all open subsets, which are contained in A. Okay. So if we have this, then we can cut out Z from both X and A if you want to compute homology. So HN of XA is isomorphic to HN of X without Z, A without Z. So we can somehow, so we have um, this space X and we have in it the subspace A. We want to compute the uh, maybe I make it a little bit bigger. You want to, this is A. You want to compute the relative homology of X and A. Well, if we have some Z which lies 
still inside this, the compute the relative homology of x and a is the same as if we throw away this. So, so if uh, this is not there. So we can, whether we, the z is here or not, we get the same relative homology. And so this is why it's called excision, because apparently, although it's not a very standard word, excision means something to excise, something means to cut something out. So we can cut z out of both x and a and get the same homology. Okay, and this is true for all n. So um, one can formulate this uh, for the proof, which I don't give, but which uh, I have to give at least some hint. One has to reformulate it in a slightly different way, I give an equivalent reformulation. Um, so let uh, say A and B be subspaces of X such that X is equal to the interior of A union the interior of B. So we can cover it by two subsets uh, by the interiors of two subsets. So for instance, if A and B are both open, it just means that X is the, that it is a union. Uh, then H star of XA is a, HN of XA is equal to HN of B, A intersected B. And this, although it's not completely obvious in the first moment, is precisely the same statement if I tell you what the relation between Z and B is. So the A, the X and the A are the same in both. And the B is, uh, I think, uh, uh, something like Z without B. Let's see. So ah, now to make it more interesting, I have actually not written what it is. So I can either try to figure it out myself or I can be lazy and uh, look it up. And so I say for, so in one direction, so maybe this is the, the first statement and the equivalent second statement is this. And then I say to go from one to two, um, I put z equal to uh, x without b. And uh, I don't know whether, and uh, to go the other around from 2 to 1, I do the opposite. I put b equal to x without z. And then you can see, so assume uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't know whether it's one to two, you know, which way around it goes, but so if um, we, for instance, if we assume we know this one and we put z equal to x without b, then the statement that the interior of b and the interior of a cover it means precisely that the closure of c is contained in the uh, interior of a. And so the, the, that, is, that, the state, that the, the assumption for A and B is fulfilled is equivalent uh, to the assumptions from Z and A to be fulfilled. And uh, as um, Z is the complement of B, taking you know, B and A intersected uh, B is, this, is a, the same as taking X without Z and A without Z. So this is just the same statement formulated you know, by once for A and B, and once for A and the complement of B. OK. <clears throat> so now let's um, try So as I said, the uh, proof is uh, amazingly complicated, although it's not 
Well, this is also a bit difficult, but anyway, so it follows the, the main step and the most difficult part is another theorem, which we will also use for something else, which is the theorem of the cover. So the main step is the theorem of the cover, is the following theorem of the cover. And this says the following. So let, uh, I don't want to use this. Let X be a topological space. And I make the same assumptions as here. So A and B subspaces such that the, inter in the interiors cover X. So then we can do the following. We call CN of A plus B. We define this to be, so let, um, this is a set of all cycles, sum sigma A sigma times sigma in Cn of x. So these are singular n chains in x. So just linear combinations as usual of uh, n sim of maps from n simply C to x uh, with the property that when if the coefficient is non-zero, so when it really is there, then the image of this n cycle of this uh, n simplex either lies in A or in B. Okay, so so if um, A sigma is different from zero, then sigma of delta n is a subset of A, or sigma of delta n is a subset of B. And then, so <clears throat> again, we can, and we make the corresponding chain complex. So we have a chain comp, so anyway, so let um, C star of A plus B by D be the co corresponding chain complex. You can see if you apply the usual D to such a thing, it also is true for the face. It, it, this will also have the same property. No? That, uh, you know. <clears throat> uh, then, um, the inclusion C star of A plus B to C star of X induces inclusion Uh, uh, induces an isomorphism on homology for all n. So if I compute the homology with these chains, where each simplex, the image of each simplex is either contained in A or in B, I get the same homology as if I allow all chains, also those where, you know, maybe it's not contained in one of the two. Okay, so this is this theorem. And um, it's not very difficult to prove from this the um, excision theorem. There is, in the notes, it is uh, briefly explained. But uh, you know, maybe it's not uh, relevant now to do this. I want to briefly tell you why such a thing could be true. 
So the main step is anyway this, and we will use this theorem again for another theorem which will be more important for us. Um, <clears throat> so therefore I want to explain about this. So we know that Cn of A plus B is contained in Cn of X, but they are usually not equal. I mean, unless some extreme cases. So normally they are not equal. So the difference is, um, um, you, know, you know, is given by, in some sense, simplices which are too large. So by uh, some a sigma times sigma, where for some sigma, sigma of delta n is not contained in A and not contained in B. But you can imagine if you have, um, here you have A and you have B. So <clears throat> if um, you have, if the image is somehow not contained in one of them, you could try to, you know, subdivide it into smaller ones so that each of them is contained in one of them. No? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, if you think of it, well, maybe this was not such a, so assume this is our picture. So, say, this is A and this is B and we have uh, the image of our simplex looks like this. So it's sticking out a little bit here and a little bit here. So if I, for instance, would instead replace this map by a map where, you know, by, by kind of two maps, where each of them, one maps to this half and one maps to this half, then it's, it's okay, you know? And so in order to prove the result, we have to somehow be allowed to subdivide our simplices. So, so the problem is the image of the simplices sigma of delta n can be too large, but uh, so, but we can subdivide. So um, delta n is equal to the union i equals 1 to k. Um, uh, delta n i, where this is the image of another n simplex, but so that uh, uh, such that <coughs> Uh, such that the image is contained in A or in B. And uh, how do you achieve this? Well, if we have such a simplex, we have the so-called barycentric subdivision. So we just divide, uh, so we take a point in the middle, we divide all the sides by half. Hope I get it right now. And so we have, um, instead of one, two simplex, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And, you know, they are somehow smaller. And each of them I can view as the image of a, of, an e, of a two simplex mapped into this thing. And then we want to replace the delta n by, so the composition of all these maps, the sum of the compositions of all these maps from delta n into this thing, identifying it with this, and summing them all up. And so there are obviously two main problems. There are a number of problems with this. So the first is that uh, 
you have to show that you can make such a subdivision if you make it often enough, you will get that the image of these smaller simplices indeed is always contained either in A or in B. And the second thing, which is maybe not obvious at all, is that if instead of using uh, the, you know, this big simplex, you use what you get by uh, subdividing it, so just the sum of the simplices which you obtain by subdividing it, that this gives you the same on homology. This you also have to show. And uh, it turns out that you can show all this, but it's uh, quite complicated. To so show that you get the same on homology, you have to prove some chain homotopy and so on, and you know you just uh, have to struggle quite a lot. But anyway, the basic idea is that it can be that your simplices are too large, and if they are too large, then you subdivide them. And then you have to work very hard to turn this into an argument. And I mean, I do not claim that I gave you a serious hint of how this is done. Okay. Anyway, this is the, um, and then it's uh, very easy from this to prove the excision theorem. So let me now try to see whether I can give you some, um, I have 10 minutes, so that's not very much. Ah, so I did not bring this. Oh yes. So, so there are two things. Uh, there's one kind of thing that I wanted to speak. In addition, we had uh, this, um, if you already did it, you had this exercise which you, are, which you were supposed to finish before uh, the lecture of Thursday. But uh, I actually, there was supposed to be a lecture of Thursday, but I have to go to the dentist, so there's no lecture on Thursday. But you can give it to me on Thursday in, in my mailbox or whatever. Um, and the last one was about relative, uh, about um, reduced homology. So if you recall, Um, <clears throat> so if X is a topological space, we had this uh, map again. Cn was a you know singular n chains, and uh, we have the differential d from Cn of X to Cn minus one of X. And uh, in the exercise about in reduced homology, I defined another differential from C0. So we defined D, uh, whatever, D sharp from C0 of X to Z, which uh, was just that if I have a, <coughs> a zero chain, so some A sigma times sigma, and in some sense it's just, this is just a point, is zero, you know, it's just a formal combination of points. This was mapped to the sum of the coefficients. Okay. And then uh, uh, otherwise, so we always use the usual D, and then so we define H zero so Hn sharp of x, the reduced homology, is defined to be Hn of x, the usual homology, if n is bigger uh, than zero. And it's called, it's the kernel of uh, this D sharp divided by the image of D from C1 of X to C0 of X uh, if N is equal to zero. So somehow I change the zeroth homology. 
the others stay the same. And the advantage of this is that it somehow simplifies some arguments because one of, so one of the things that one finds that you use for this is that if I take this D sharp con composed with D, this is the zero map. This was part of the exercise. And uh, the result that one proves or that you prove is that if uh, X is path connected, then uh, H0 sharp of X is zero. So somehow the fact that you, you know, make H0 smaller by taking the kernel here, instead of being Z, if, if it's path connected, it's zero. And that makes a number of arguments simpler. Um, <clears throat> and I say this here because of uh, um, following results which I state without proof but which are uh, simple modifications of uh, what uh, uh, we had before namely so the first uh, so it's a kind of corollary so first so <clears throat> so the long exact homology sequence also holds for reduced homology. I mean, where you, <coughs> okay. So we have a, you know, we can, in the long exact uh, homology sequence, we can change what we have at level zero uh, by this, and it still is exact. So it ends um, delta H zero sharp of X of A goes to and I think actually can have H zero of. But anyway, this is not so important because if X and A, for instance, are connected, it means it ends with zero here. So if X and A are path connected, we get already, uh, get, get already H sharp zero of A is equal to zero. So somehow the, the homology sequence is simpler. And <clears throat> also the excision theorem, oh no, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is uh, something I wanted to mention. And this, what? What? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, in order for it to make sense, I should take the reduced homology, which would be the, uh, the quotient. But I mean, I will only apply this when, when say, X and A are connected, in which case it's anyway zero here, and I don't care about what's there. Okay, so now time is almost up, but I also started a bit late, so I can say a few more, a couple of more things. So, now I want to give an application. I don't think I will finish it, but I can first set things up a bit more. So I want to give one apl application of the, this excision theorem to prove some theorem. So first I define um, something which we, is anyway useful. So let X be a topological space. Uh, 
and A in X is subspace. Well, uh, in the exercise, we were told what a retraction is, but I can maybe just repeat it. So a map R from X to A is a retraction, so a continuous map. is a retraction if uh, its restriction to A is the identity. Okay. And we had seen that this has, that this means that uh, the induced map on homology by the inclusion is, um, the, uh, is uh, injective, I think was an exercise. And now we want uh, something else. So A is called uh, a strong uh, deformation retract. Of X, if uh, you know, you have such a retraction, but you have more. Namely, if there is a homotopy uh, F from X times zero one uh, to X. So such that uh, f of x zero is equal to x for all x and x. Um, f of x one is an element in A for all x in x, and f of a t is equal to a for all t in 0, 1 and all a in a. So what you can see is that this, so in other words, you have that f in particular is a homotopy from um, so we have the identity on X um, So let me see. So you can see. <clears throat> so if you take, if you put R, is a map from X to A. And we also have the inclusion of A then this says that F is a homotopy from um, say <clears throat> Uh, so how does it go? From the identity, so we get here, at zero we get the identity, the identity of X to um, I composed with R. Okay. 
And so in particular, it means in particular um, <coughs> we find that A and X are homotopy equivalent. Because you have a homotopy, a homotopy equivalent from uh, one to I composed with R. And if you take the other composition, R composed with I, this is the identity on A. No? Because the, the map uh, R, so here if you look at it, F of A T is A for all A in A. So we have A, and in this case, if you have a strong deformation retract of X, we have that A and X are homotopy equivalent. So I should maybe have explained it slightly differently. So we have, we start with A being a ret this retraction, which we here take as a, the map at one. And then we have a homotopy between this uh, and the identity. So the statement, <coughs> okay. So this is um, a particularly kind of typical example of a deformation retract. So one example would be, for instance, if you have, um, say, you know, one thing is so so if we take the point zero in Rn, then uh, this is a deformation retract. You can just, uh, if you have any point, you can just, uh, you know, make the homotopy by, so, um, so how, what would you say? You take F of uh, X comma T should be T times X. Then you can see that, uh, now I don't know whether I got it the correct way. It's precisely the correct, incorrect way round. So it, it's more natural in this way, obviously, but uh, then I would have to change it here. So if you, therefore I could say one minus T times X, which is a bit less natural. But you can see when uh, t goes to 1, then we go to 0. The map is always the identity at the point 0. So it precisely has this property. And so this, after all, shows that Rn is contractible, which you already know. OK, so next time we will use this to make an application, maybe I can just say what the application is so that you, which is kind of funny, <clears throat> something which you might consider obvious, but which is not so easy to prove. So it's called uh, often invariance of dimension. So let U subset Rn, V subset Rm be non-empty open subsets. Assume U is homeomorphic to V. Then it follows that n is equal to m. So an open subset of some uh, Rn cannot be homeomorphic to an open subset of another Rm. So somehow the dimension, you know, you would think that the, an open subset of Rn has dimension n in some sense. The dimension is something which is invariant under homeomorphism, which is a, a power are not clear, and we will see how one can prove this uh, using the excision theorem. Okay. <clears throat>